Hi, this is JP Haas. I'm going to do MSK MRI 101 protocols, reading patterns and reports for elbow. This is uh, supposed to be a high yield basic starters approach to reading elbow MRI in the bone room. Hopefully uh, after going through this and spending a little time with it, you'll be able to hit the ground running in how you want to look at elbow MRI in the bone room so you're not intimidated uh, when a case comes up. Uh, it's going to be emphasized on trying to look at some normal uh, anatomy with uh, scrollable images. So this uh, will be available to you to look at on your own and I think will be a good resource uh, to look at the reading pattern that's in this um, module and then correlate that with scrolling on the images in this case or in this uh, presentation versus uh, any elbow MRI that you that you open or find uh, that you can use to look at the elbow anatomy. So with that in mind, we can get started. Um, the outline is going to be MRI elbow protocols and uses. So just uh, some quick commentary on what the elbow protocol MRI is so you know what that is. Uh, a short thing on reporting with uh, freehand versus template reporting with a note that uh, MSK radiologists at our institution use uh, freehand reporting. Uh, we're going to use a pattern-based reading approach, so we're just going to do a checklist approach where we have all the structures that are in a list, and then you can have that as a reference. Uh, and then you just go down and look at every single one of those to make sure you evaluate every single thing and don't miss anything. Uh, and then, like I said, at the end, there'll be a normalist study that you can use for scrolling yourself. And then also within the presentation itself, there are uh, the same images embedded so we can look at the anatomy. The routine elbow has... Uh, Six sequences, um, axial, coronal, and sagittal T1 and PD fat saturated images. So it's a simple protocol. Um, it, it's used for the vast majority of all studies, uh, occult fractures, ligamentous and muscular tendons injury, basically the, spe the spectrum of uh, routine elbow pathology. Um, and uh, it's uh, a fairly straightforward protocol. This is how I lay out in packs most of the time. I like to have those coronal images at the um, Top left, I put the uh, axial images at the bottom left, and I put the sagittal images towards the side. Um, so this would be like on a on a multi monitor setup where I have a four by four setup with these um, on the left monitor and those others on the right monitor. Then the other part of the right monitor can be used for comparison or whatever you'd like. My advice would be just to find what way you like to look at these uh, images or exams, and then just be consistent about how you do it. Do whatever makes sense for you, but try to be consistent about it. This is the reading pattern. Um, it emphasizes tendons first, then ligaments, then bones, articular cartilage, joint spaces, loose bodies, plica, neurovascular structures, and then muscles. Um, it's kind of an outside-in approach, how I tend to look at most joints, and uh, we just take things one by one. So what I'll do throughout this presentation is just snip uh, little parts of this, um, little parts of this, um, template. So for example, first we'll be looking at the anterior tendons of the elbow, then I might slip this and that'll be down at the bottom right hand side of the screen. So we can use, we're, we just know we'll be looking at that portion of the uh, reading pattern. But once you get comfortable with um, going through this reading pattern and seeing all the anatomy, you'll get used to how the anatomy looks and then you'll be more comfortable with how to read these MRIs. I think that elbow is probably the least imaged joint. So um, it maybe is for that reason a little bit uh, more hard or scary to learn just because they don't come up as much. Uh, and you might not get a chance to see that many, but, um, you know, just use a systematic approach and it, it, it's, it's not very intimidating. Here's template, a uh, little thing, a template reporting. This template was just pulled from the RSNA RAD report website where you can find all kinds of uh, report template reporting for radiology. This is a fairly long one. Um, I don't know. This is, uh, you know, got a lot of different things you have to click and select every every single thing for every single structure. So I, I, I think this one is a little more complicated and uh, long than uh, typically, we would use, especially at this institution, but just know that these are out there, and if you want to try to create one of these that makes um, makes sense for you, that that could be a possibility for the future. Okay, the MRI systematic approach is, uh, like I said, probably the most least common commonly imaged uh, joint. So, you know, I like to keep my E anatomy or my Freitas Rad F R E I T A S R A D dot net uh, uh, websites handy because I I think those are really useful just to refresh and uh, you know look at the anatomic structures um, be consistent about what uh, you want to look at in uh, the same pattern and do it every single time and uh, like I said I go from tendons to ligaments to bones to cartilage to joint space plica neurovascular structures and then muscles and that's a mouthful but we can take it one at a time 
this is a really nice picture, I thought. It has just uh, colored uh, notations for each of these uh, attachment sites, which if you just, uh, you know, really spend some time just staring at this one image, you're actually going to know most of uh, the ligamentous uh, and tendinous anatomy of the elbow that's really important. Um, and um, I guess we can just kind of go through it quickly. So you have, you know, the, the common extensor tendon comes to the ex external or lateral epicondyle, the fl common flexor tendon at the medial epicondyle. So uh, those are kind of the two intuitive ones. Uh, just adjacent to that, we have the lateral columnar ligament, also called the radio collateral ligament, and the lateral ulnar collateral ligament. We'll get that in more detail later. And the other important ligament at the lateral elbow would be the annular ligament. So the three, the three lateral ligaments of the elbow, the radio collateral ligament, the lateral ulnar collateral ligament, or luccal, and the annular ligament. And since we're th thinking about ligaments, we'll just come over here and just say, yes, the most important portion of the uh, medial ligaments is definitely the anterior band of the ulnar collateral ligament. Um, and you can just see its attachment sites at the undersurface of the epicondyle uh, to the uh, sublime tubercle of the, uh, of the proximal ulna. And um, then we have the uh, biceps and brachialis insertions. And we can always find this biceps insertion on the uh, radial tuberosity and the uh, brachialis insertion inserts on the proximal ulna. So I think that's most all of the things that are on this coronal uh, image um, of the important things to, uh, to know. Uh, here's a triceps attachment site on the olecranon. And then <clears throat> this is, um, this looks like a lateral view of the uh, elbow. And I think it's the same color, color uh, system here. So this is, um, this is where the, uh, This is actually showing where uh, portions of the annular ligament attach to correlate with that more turquoise uh, there. And then just posterior to that where the luccal attaches, the lateral ulnar collateral ligament attaches on that uh, lateral side of the elbow. Okay, so we're gonna start with tendons here. Um, this is a nice picture uh, from Radsource, which is a great resource for uh, different MSK type of things. Um, there's two main structures to evaluate for tendons in the anterior elbow, the biceps, which has a long head and a short head, and the brachialis. Uh, the, the long head biceps tendon uh, comes down and attaches, uh, has uh, both long and short heads and attaches on the uh, radial tuberosity. Uh, so if you can remember the long head, um, which we know from shoulder MRI, is what goes through that bicipital groove uh, that we look at and focus on, on on the shoulder MRI, but it has a little bit more of a proximal insertion, so it's denoted here in red. Uh, and the short head, which comes from the coracoid process, comes down and inserts more distally. So sometimes you can have tears of just one of those. So if you see a tear that seems to be a little bit more proximal, then you call that a long head biceps uh, tear. And then you, if it's, it's more distal, you could potentially call it, oh yeah, it seems to be more involving the short head biceps insertion. Uh, this is covered by the Lacertus fibrosis, which is a aponeurotic structure, which uh, covers the um, biceps tendon at the level of the uh, distal ulna. Excuse me, at the level, it, it begins proximally at the level of the, of the uh, distal humerus, and then kind of wraps around the uh, ulna at the medial elbow. Okay, so these are what we're going to look at with the with the images. Uh, these are taken from e anatomy, so you can follow on axial images and uh, you and find uh, the biceps, which just comes down and has a nice insertion on the uh, radial tuberosity, and then just adjacent to that, attaching to the proximal ulna, will be our our brachialis. So those are how those structures look on axial, where they come down to attach to their sites. Now on these axial images, I've tried to just to give everybody a frame of reference of where we're exactly at on the uh, thumbnail or coronal images. So we know we're uh, just past the level of the elbow joint to where those insertion sites are of the uh, biceps and of the brachialis tendons. We're gonna follow that ourselves though with, uh, with our own image here. So as we come down and we have, um, actually I think we're going distal to proximal. So that'd be a, that'll be a, <laughs> be a little more challenging because we always usually go proximal to distal, at least intuitively for me. So I think we're already in those tendons. Uh, and if you look right here, you'll see these, um, these attachment sites of this biceps insertion and this brachialis insertion here. So we've only gone a couple images, but we've already kind of hit them. And that's what we're looking for when we uh, look at these images. So then we're coming up and those are those tendons coming out. So, and then once they're more formed here, we know this is the biceps here and this is the brachialis here, the tendon part at least. So that's how those look.
can do that again on your own if you'd like. I cannot do it again on the uh, recording, unfortunately, so I apologize. And now we're in the distal upper arm here. Okay, so the posterior tendons are um, the triceps. So those are uh, fairly straightforward. They have three heads, but um, usually we just make an overall assessment of the triceps insertion in this, in the, unless there's abnormality, and then we can kind of break this down, this anatomy down in more detail if we needed. Um, but I evaluate the uh, tendons, uh, the triceps tendons on axial and especially the sagittal because the sagittal is usually very well seen coming down to insert on the olecranon. Um, as we go from medial to lateral, uh, there's three different heads that you can try to remember. Um, the medial head, uh, the long head is uh, right here, the first one right here, uh, the medial head right here, and the lateral head over here. Now that's a uh, that's just, I, I don't know, no real good way to remember that, at least in, in my mind. But what I do try to remember is that the, um, what I do try to remember is that M, the medial head, is what inserts more anteriorly and it has a, can have a predominantly muscular insertion. So we'll see that in the images here. And the long and lateral head uh, insert more posteriorly. So um, here's the, a sagittal run. Looks like we're starting laterally because we're going to, Look at this radio capitellar articulation first so we know we're coming from the lateral elbow and we're going to come into the triceps and we can see the triceps nicely inserting on um, the posterior olecranon here so that's the triceps insertion but you know it's not just this black tendinous part it's also this uh, muscular attachment part and uh, you can remember that this muscular part uh, can be abnormal too or and it's uh, the uh, medial head of the triceps insertion. So that's the in entire triceps complex attaching at the elbow. Here it is on axial. So once again, we had those radial head brachialis insertions. Now we're going to come up and look for our um, triceps. And we see our nice normal triceps insertion here with our lateral long head lateral and long heads posteriorly and our medial head more anteriorly. Okay, uh, same caveat I'm saying here is a little more anteriorly is the medial head, which is emphasized here, and the more posterior tendinous attachment, which is the long and lateral head, which is emphasized here. We're gonna repeat ourselves until we know it. That's how I try to do things. Uh, one injury pattern that you can have with this in mind is an, a tendinous rupture of the more posterior tendons, the long and lateral heads, with the still predominant intact anterior attachment of the medial head. So here's an example where this uh, green uh, noted uh, muscular attachment of the medial head of the biceps was more intact with this uh, ruptured tendon here uh, involving the long and lateral heads, which is more posteriorly. And this is a fat pad. I'm pretty sure that they were uh, putting the F for. All right, so we're going to move on to flexor tendon now. Uh, flexor tendon inserts at the medial epicondyle, so the flexor tendon is a, is a medial structure. There's three main structures uh, that go from anterior to posteriorly to remember. There's other ones that will that will show as well that are uh, associated or near the uh, near the uh, fl uh, common flexor tendon. But the three main to know about the common flexor tendon proper is the FCR, the palmaris longus, and the flexor carpi ulnaris. FCR, palmaris longus, FCU. Um, in the same location and basically uh, associated with this also is the flexor digitorum superficialis. And um, we're going to show you this on some images. So uh, this the, the workhorse sequence here would be a, a coronal image. So especially the fluid sensitive images, if you're going to call common flexor tendon origin tendinosis or tear, you're just uh, looking at, you know, these structures that all come together at this at this medial epicondyle and insert here. And it would be much more common for us to say, you know, there is common flexor tendon origin tendinosis. We are not going to uh, try to separate out these different tendon parts. This is just to go over the anatomy, just so at least you know it. Uh, but uh, almost all the time, you're going to say common flexor tendon origin tendinosis or common flexor tendon origin partial tear without actually trying to say, oh, I think this involves the FCR or something like that. That doesn't happen. So. Um, the axial is the other sequence that can help you uh, support your findings here. If you think there's an abnormality on the coronal, try to correlate with that, that with the axial, uh, and that should help. All right, so this is um, 
This is our scrollable images here. So we're gonna be looking for the common flexor tendon. Um, this is the fluid sensitive version. So common flexor tendon origin, this is radius, which is a more lateral. So we're gonna be trying to look over here on the medial side. Um, so let's keep that in mind as we try to find this ep uh, distal humerus medial epicondyle and find our common flexor tendon origin, which looks like it's coming in right here. So this is a nice, normal, dark attachment at the common flexor tendon origin. No concern here for um, partial tear tendinosis or abnormality. That's a normal look as those structures come together on the coronal images. One more slice where it still looks like it's common flexor as well. Okay, so we're gonna move on here just through these last couple images. Coming out into that triceps insertion, just emphasize there. Close to your part of the elbow. All right, here's a nice diagram that I thought helped helped me visualize the common flexor tendon origins. Like uh, once once again, the flexor carpi radialis, <laughs> the palmaris longus, and the FCU are the main structures. So these kind of three right here. Now also right here is the FDS. So FDS is right here, and it's just at the posterior margin of this at, at right here. Um, so uh, FCR, palmaris longus, FCU, and then FDS is all basically the common uh, flexor tendon origin. Um, the, uh, the, uh, flexor, so I, I like to think of the, um, FCR and pronator teres together, um, cause that kit has been termed the flexor pronator mass right there. And, uh, I try to remember that as being at just at the, the anterior margin of the, um, of the common flexor tendon, uh, in this region here. And if there's, you know, first hit area, like what, what becomes abnormal first, it's often that flexor pronator mass. Uh, for the common flexor tendon origin pathology. So I hope that's not too confusing, but at least that's how I try to think about it. And here on, a, on the bottom left, a couple of nice uh, more textbook style images of what common flexor tendon origin um, partial tears can look like. A little bit less uh, severe on the left side here and a little bit more severe, but it still looks like partial tear on the uh, on the uh, right side, uh, right image here. Now, just this was you know noted severe and this was noted moderate. Uh, medial epicondylitis or partial tearing of the common flexor tendon origin. Okay, just some highlighted uh, notations here of what this looks like on E anatomy, uh, just coming from front to back, um, flexor carpi radialis, palmaris longus, and FCU. And once again, emphasizing this pronator teres, which isn't a muscle I think about all the time, but you know, if I can just like, okay, flexor pronator mass, what's the flexor pronator mass? That's the flexor carpi radialis and the pronator teres. It's the common flexor tendon origin. It's kind of one of the areas that probably is becomes abnormal first, uh, typically in a uh, common flexor tendon pathology. Um, and then lastly, the other part, just at the, o the other thing that sort of inserts here, that's uh, part of the um, common flexor tendon is the FDS. And this is repeated here, just showing that same anatomy coming in. Common extension tendon is on the other side. So this is the common, uh, this is a lateral epicondyle. The common extension tendon has three main contrib contributors coming from anterior to posterior. And I uh, just kind of have to remember these, they're all E's, ED, ECRB, EDC, ECU. Um, and it did stick in my mind for other reasons. So I don't, I, I don't think we say a ECRB uh, partial tear uh, most of the time, but you know, just it's, it's probably good to know. It, it could be asked, what is the first or most commonly injured um, part of the common extensor tendon origin and the first hit tendon there is typically extensor carpi radialis brevis, which is right here. Um, the extensor carpi radialis, radialis longus is also in the same location, but it's not as, as a distinct part of the common extensor tendon origin. As you can see here, it has a little bit more of a proximal insertion on the distal humerus and not inserting right on that distal epicondyle. So ECRB, EDC, ECU, part of that common extensor tendon origin where we call that common extensor tendinosis partial tear. And the other thing that's sort of nearby there is the ECRL. Um, there's a couple other tendons that also merge into the common extensor tendon origin that are good to know uh, just to have all the anatomy down. And that is the posterior part has extensor digit digit minimi and the anterior part has supinator. And I, you know, this is a lot of anatomy to try to get down, but like, but I, uh, you know, if you do read these, um, frequently or on a routine basis, it, it, it would be good to know because then you could just kind of remember what, what, what is on just the margins of the um, common extensor tendon um, 
insertion uh, to know what other muscles you're looking at, you know, or else you just look it up, that's fine as well. But we can look at that on the um, on our scrollable images, see if it makes some more sense. And it's not all word salad. So this is common extensor tendon origin. We are coming from, I think, anterior to posterior. Um, so we're going to be trying to emphasize the lateral elbow here. Um, which is this side of the elbow, since we know that's the radius, which is the more lateral side. Um, so, you know, the, we're not going to be able to see these separately, but, you know, the ex common extensor tendon origin is going to come in here somewhere. We're going to know the first anterior one is going to be um, our ECRB. But here you see this starting to come up here, and that's our common extensor tendon origin. So here is our common extensor tendon origin here and there and there, I'm trying not to cover it up too much. And it has a little bit of signal in it, not too much. Sometimes it's a judgment call, is that just variant versus normal? On this case, I would say, oh, it doesn't look different than the common flexor tendon origin. There wasn't any really concern or symptoms or whatever. And this was just a predominant, predominantly normal. And the, um, and the coronal is the main workhorse sequence to see all that. All right, let's see if we have any more images. Uh, this is the common extensor tendon origin on axial. So here's our ECRB, our EDC, ECU would also be somewhere right here, not specifically mentioned. And again, with the cross-reference of where we are in the thumbnail. Uh, but the, not, not as important for routine reading to say what each of these individual structures are, but just to know that the common extensor tendon origin is at the lateral epicondyle. And then you can reference what exactly those tendons are as needed. Here's a typical case of severe partial tear of the common extensor tendon origin, AKA lateral epicondylitis or tennis elbow. Um, now one important note is the common extensor tendon, tendon can be contiguous with the adjacent lateral ligaments, uh, the radial collateral ligament and the luckal. So we'll have to go through that as we look at the ligaments, but this is a good example, at least on these couple of images, you know, this is all tearing of the, of the uh, common um, extensor tendon origin, but just adjacent to this, you have the lateral ligaments, the radial collateral ligament and the luckal depending on kind of where you are. And that's, th these are not normal as well. And, and those, those abnormalities can go together, but that's just to be kept in mind that, you know, this is not all tendon here. At the deep margin of this, there has to be the lateral ligaments, which are the capsular ligaments of the elbow. Right here. All right, so we're gonna scroll again here. And this is an example, I believe, of common extensor tendon origin tendinosis and partial tear. Okay, so we come into it here. This is a typical kind of a typical case that we see. Um, and uh, again, this is almost the same anatomy showing the common extensor tendon or severe common extensor, extensor tendinosis and partial tearing. And then also some probably ligamentous abnormality at the deep portion of the elbow here. All right, let's look at the medial ligaments. Uh, the most important of these by far is the ulnar collateral ligament anterior band. Um, that's probably the only one that we really need to emphasize. Um, there's a posterior band that you can know as well, just because it's the floor of the cubital tunnel. And the transverse band is, uh, I believe pointless because it has uh, the distinction of going from the ulna to the ulna, so not really doing that much. Um, and um, we assess this on coronal first, but um, the, the min there's minimal increased signal and broadening at the proximal attachment as a normal variant in the anterior band of the UCL. So this is kind of a nice normal look where you have the distal attachment here, which is dark and nice and thin. This uh, mid substance is also nice and thin. And then as you get towards its uh, proximal attachment, it's just a little bit more broad and has a little bit more uh, heterogeneous uh, signal, intermediate signal that can be normal variant. We're going to follow that here on our coronals. Let's see if we're coming in here to post yearly. We're going to try to find it um, as it courses from the undersurface of the medial epicondyle to the sublime tubercle. So here it is uh, our lateral side here, our medial side here. So we're going to be focusing on this side of the elbow. Let's see if we can find it. This looks like it's going to start to be an attachment here and here. So this is nice. Look how nice this looks, nice and normal. This normal uh, sublime turbicle attachment of the uh, anterior band of the UCL as it comes up and attaches here in its mid substance and then at the undersurface of the medial epicondyle has a little bit more of a broadened signal, but normal. 
that's a normal anterior band of the UCL. All right, let's follow this through on the axial. Try not to miss it. Um, landmark that's good for the axial is the cubital tunnel. So this little structure here is the floor of the cubital tunnel. That's going to be our posterior band of the UCL. So somewhere out here is going to be our anterior band. Now it's um, not as well seen, especially without triangulation on the axial images. But uh, I think we were in this area here. So I'm sorry if I didn't notate that perfectly, but that's where we're looking um, for the anterior band of the ulnar collateral ligament. Follow that through. Okay, ligaments medial. Um, here's another, basically what we just looked at, but just showing how there's an anterior bundle and a posterior bundle on the axial images. Uh, and just adjacent to that ulnar nerve uh, is the floor of the cubital tunnel, which is the which is the posterior bundle of the UCL. Um, here's a couple examples of UCL partial tear. So this is at the proximal attachment. This is a little bit broad, but a little too broad. I mean, there's a little too much signal in addition to this almost near fluid signal here. So that was a UCL partial tear. Here's a little bit more of a uh, substantive partial tear where you have a little more fluid signal at this uh, proximal attachment of the anterior band of the UCL. The ulnar collateral ligament has a finding called the T sign, which is especially help, helpful on arthrogram. You can have partial tears of the uh, UCL at the sublime tubercle, where you will see this little indentation of contrast uh, adjacent to its distal attachment. You shouldn't typically not have that um, happen. So if you have your, uh, it's a, kind of a sideways T, but if you have fluid in the joint space, fluid, there's a little recess here of the joint itself. But if there's another little portion or a recess of fluid extending down there uh, at the sublime tubercle, that's the T sign for a partial tear of the sublime of, of the uh, UCL. Sometimes that's helpful. Just wanted to show it since it was a nice picture. Um, lateral ligaments. Um, there's lateral ligaments we've already touched on a little bit. Uh, there's three main ones to know. I think these are all worth knowing. Uh, the radial collateral ligament, the lateral ulnar collateral ligament, and the annular ligament. Uh, the imp well, important uh, distinction is that the luccal and the radial collateral ligament are basically uh, continue in from one another and you can't separate them out. It's not like they have a separation between the two uh, on routine images. So if you're starting anteriorly and, and coming across the images from uh, anterior to posterior on the coronal images, uh, when you first see the ligaments or at the lateral elbow, just think of the radial collateral ligament as showing up first and the lateral ulnar collateral ligament as showing up second. And lateral ulnar collateral ligament inserts at the supernator crest of the proximal ulna, which I don't, it's not super important to know that, but uh, we can watch how that follows through on the uh, anatomy. And the, I think the luccal typically has a look on uh, coronal images that we can see. So let's see if we can see that. The annular ligament, I, I like to look on the axial and sagittals, and I'll show you that as well. Um, wraps around the radial head and attaches at the volar and dorsal side of the sigmoid notch of the ulna. And this is that look of the, of the luccal here in the middle. So you can typically, this is more towards the posterior part of the, uh, of the ligament, of the lateral ligaments as you're kind of coming off the dorsal margin of the radial head. Um, you see how this ligament just kind of comes down and wraps around as a sling and inserts at the supinator crest. That's, the, that's what I'm trying to show you. So see, try to look at some elbow MRIs, just see if you can make that, make that look pop to you. And uh, that's typically how the luckle looks to me on the coronals. Here's an example of the annular ligament uh, at the volar margin of the distal radius. All right, let's see if we can find these on our study. So what are we trying to find here? The luccal, the radial collateral ligament, the annular ligament. On the uh, coronal, we're going to come anterior to posterior. So like I said before, coming anterior to posterior, we're going to uh, find the radial capitellar joint or the lateral elbow and the ligaments of this lateral capsule is going to be first the radial collateral ligament. So that's the deep portion here is the radial collateral ligament. We've already said uh, the common extensor tendon origin is superficial to that. So as we follow this through, this is the radial uh, collateral ligament here. And then as we come, at some point that becomes the lateral ulnar collateral ligament. And you can see posteriorly how this is trying to form a little sling here around the radial head slash neck right here to insert at the supinator crest. So that was a pretty good run through to see the radial collateral ligament, the lateral ulnar collateral ligament. We don't see the uh, we don't see the um, annual ligament that well on this uh, sequence. 
So here's another look. What I like to do is to try to come and find a couple images here where I can find the insertion sites of the radial, uh, excuse me, of the annular ligament on the uh, ulna. So I want to try to make sure I can see that I think those are attaching well and just trying to visualize this annular ligament is again wrapping around the radial head here. And um, I, I do correlate as well the um, the uh, radial collateral ligament and luckal a little bit the best I can, but it you know it, you just have to know it's the deep structures here that uh, are deep to the extensor tendon origin. So that's one run through on the axials. Here's an e-anatomy picture of the uh, ligaments here, just showing again the uh, the uh, annular ligament insertions, which is a picture I like to try to find. And here's a picture of um, some normal uh, anatomy from a radiographics article showing normal, um, normal-ish or normal ra uh, radial collateral ligament and luckal. I think this is the, probably the radial collateral ligament. This is definitely the luckal. I'm not going to go through this um, caption here right now, but this is all normal anatomy. Maybe this is showing the common extensor tendon origin. as well. Looks like it probably is with this um, white arrow. Okay, fair enough. Marrow. Uh, marrow is an uh, assessment you need to make. Um, use your T1s especially to look at if this marrow signal is normal. The fatty yellow marrow should have a T1 hyper intense signal. Um, and this is where I can use the fluid sensitive sequences to look for any other abnormalities of the bone itself. So look for bone lesions, fractures, contusions, subchondral edema related to arthritis, etc. I just gave one random example here of a source of the sort of finding you could make here from radiology assistant with little league or elbow, elbow uh, medial apophysitis of a ununited um, ossification center of the uh, elbow. Another uh, couple comments here on bones. Um, you want to look at both the radiocapitellar and the ulnar trochlear joint, um, especially the capitellum where osteochondral lesion is common. Uh, one thing to always keep in mind is the pseudo defect of the posterior capitellum. Cross reference to the coronal and sagittal to uh, stay away from this pitfall because a lot of the times as you're coming across the posterior part of the radiocapitellar joint, this is going to look a little abnormal. Uh, so you're like, oh, is this like an osteochondral defect or a cartilage problem? Uh, I'm worried about that. So you have a pseudo defect that you can have there because if you cut the joint right, you're actually coming off the articulating surface of the capitellum. So you're not at a cartilage bearing surface and that's a pseudo defect. So this capitellum finding is not a true abnormality. It's a pseudo abnormality or not uh, a fake out basically. Um, so just know if you're looking for uh, osteochondral lesions of the capitellum, those have to be usually towards the mid to more anterior portions of the uh, coronal images when you triangulate those. Other findings. So here is some example of some more true osteochondral lesions. We see those on x-ray as lucencies and the uh, capitellum. Uh, on the MRI, we have edema in the capitellum and as well as uh, overlying cartilage abnormality. Um, osteochondral lesions is typically in uh, younger patients. So think of this as um, 12 to 20 year old um, patients or athletes with chronic valgus overload throwing athletes. I'll put a quick comment about that um, uh, in a minute uh, just to, uh, to uh, to uh, just show what chronic or valgus overload syndrome is. And then the panner disease is younger people, kids, and that's avascular necrosis of the capitellum, typically a little bit younger, five to 12 year olds. So I don't know if we see a lot of pediatric elbow MRI here overall, I don't think we do, uh, but uh, these are in general less prone to cartilage problems or loose bodies. Um, this is an osteochondral lesion, which did not show evidence of instability. So the main finding for instability, if you can see rim fluid signal undermining that lesion and displacing the lesion. Okay, uh, uh, getting towards the end here with bones. Uh, here's an example of panner disease where we have capitellar edema, but the overlying cartilage is okay, and this patient was young. So that's uh, an example of panner disease. Sometimes this can have the typical findings of avascular necrosis as well, where you have that serpiginous uh, T1 and uh, heterogeneous kind of areas of low T1. And uh, on, the, on the fluid sensitive even just low and high signal serpiginous linear findings, which can be seen with avascular necrosis. Articular cartilage is something we want to look at as well. Um, we can use we can look at this in all three planes, assess, assessing for arthritis. Here's another just po point of the valgus overload syndrome, which I'll wrap up with, with just a summary uh, diagram shortly here. But this is a posterior medial osteophyte, which you see in um, 
valgus overload syndrome. So if you have osteophytes with edema at that location and, and, and younger people who don't usually have that, that's a finding that goes with valgus overload. So if I'm looking for, if, if I do have an elbow MRI with a thrower or something like that, this is a good place to zero in on. Just go, go to those axials, go to the um, posterior medial uh, joint space of the ulnar trochlear joint and look for, um, look for those posterior medial osteophytes that look like exactly like this in this picture. Okay, so let's look at an uh, image here, um, articular cartilage. So here's a um, axial. So maybe we'll be emphasizing like we were just looking at recently on that picture. So here's the cartilage here at the ulnal trochlear joint. Uh, don't see any abnormalities. There's no osteophytes. There's no joint space issues. So that looks more normal. And then coming in the, on the coronals for the radiocapitellar ulnal trochlear joints. Again, just looking at we start at the front, so this would be more where we'd be expecting a, a capitella abnormal. If we see one, that looks normal. This cartilage and joint space looks normal, so we're pretty happy with how that looks. This is a more normal look. Uh, joints, loose bodies, and plica. Uh, we can look at, at the size of the joint effusion, describe loose bodies if they're there. Uh, something to know about is plica or synovial folds of the radiocapitella articulation. There is an anterior, a lateral, and a posterior lateral. Um, and these can be seen just as little meniscoid looking things in that joint space. Um, and here's a diagram of how they look with the anterior, the lateral, and the posterior, la posterior lateral of how they look. Um, if they're too thick or edematous or causing symptoms, they can have uh, plica syndromes that can be associated with that. Um, but here's a couple examples of more normal looking, like a normal looking lateral menis meniscoid looking thing. That's a lateral fold of a plica. And here's a posterior lateral fold of a plica. So if you do see that, that's not necessarily abnormal. They, they, that's basically normal variant anatomy that, that you can see, and that's good to know about. Um, here's another diagram showing where the anterior and posterior lateral folds would be. Um, these are normal, posterior fold, posterior lateral fold, and anterior fold, uh, which were uh, pretty normal. Let's see if we can find any on our case. Here's the coronal. Not too much, maybe just a little tiny bit there, looking at that lateral fold there. So that's just what our case has. And then on the sagittals, we could look for any evidence of anterior or posterior lateral plica and maybe a little bit of posterior lateral there is what I would say. Okay, so those are the plica. We did not see joint fluid fusion or loose bodies in our case. Here's an example of an in theory what a plica syndrome would look like. You know, think just think about degenerative changes with chondrosis and edema and an angry looking edematous plica potentially. So this is a capsular edema here. This is a thickened edematous posterior lateral plica, uh, uh, and that with adjacent fibrosis, yeah. And that would be consistent with the plica syndrome. So symmetry is always helpful. I mean, you don't see much out here for an anterior fold. Clearly, there's any symmetry with their posterior lateral fold. So this is a pathologic uh, case showing that finding. Neurovascular structures. Um, we talked briefly about the floor being the posterior band of the UCL. The roof is uh, the retinaculum, or there is a retinaculum of the roof. So that's a, a tunnel, uh, the cubital tunnel which is a common medial elbow issue in overuse, subluxation, trauma, degenerative changes, if there's an accessory muscle or mass. So we can look at that. One of the main structures in there is the ulnar nerve. So we typically, as part of our reading pattern approach, we'll look at the ulnar nerve and just make sure that looks normal. It's not too bright, it's not too thick. And here's, this is a kind of a hedgy finding sometimes, so you have to just do your best and get experience. But here's an example of where you definitely call a thick, bright nerve consistent with ulnar neuritis in the cubital tunnel. Uh, other comments on the uh, neurovascular structures that, uh, you know, this could be reference. I don't, you know, it doesn't come up every case for sure. But um, if you go to the level of the um, radial head, you can look for your radial nerve, uh, your median nerve, and your ulnar nerve, and just kind of know rough, uh, roughly where those are. I don't think it needs to be uh, harped on too much, like what the adjacent muscles are, how the brachialis and brachioradialis are near the, are near the radial nerve. But um, you know, if you want to get practice at knowing this anatomy, the uh, landmark that I think is a good thing to go to is just the radial head. And you'll say, okay, this is the radial nerve. This is the median nerve, deep to pronator teres. And this is the ulnar nerve, the one we usually look at and try to find an abnormality with if it's there in the cubital tunnel. So kind of go through that quickly. 
All right, here's the um, here's the radial head. I'm already kind of getting out of it, but this is kind of our where we expect our radial nerve, our median nerve, and our ulnar nerve. So you can scroll on those and do that as you like, but that's the general idea. Okay, there's an ulnar nerve coming more towards the cubital tunnel. Erase. There's other more uh, detailed abnormality you can have. Like for example, the radial nerve can branch into the posterior interosseous nerve and give you posterior interosseous nerve syndrome, but they, you know, that's beyond the scope of this lecture. The type of anatomy though you can use as a springboard to learning more about things as you need to or want to. Okay, so finishing up here through there. Uh, here's just an example of that, uh, or at least the anatomy that goes with that deep radial nerve coming into the posterior interosseous nerve, which dives into the supinator here. Uh, which is this kind of semicircular muscle. And if you get edema here um, in the uh, supinator and extensor carpi ulnaris, that's posterior interosseous nerve syndrome. So a little bit more advanced than we would want for basic MRI anatomy, but just, just one little you know continuation. Okay, we know the nerves, this is what they do, this is what, the, what can happen. And the pin syndrome will give you supinator extensor issues. Um, median nerve is uh, near Lacertus fibrosus and pronator teres, fine. Um, that's kind of the landmark, just more for the anatomy here. And then the muscles, we do a run of the muscles just to look for any abnormalities, edema masses associated with the muscles. Uh, myotendinous strains is a finding you can have if there's edema located at the myotendinous junction. Uh, denervation changes, acute versus chronic, uh, fatty atrophy if you have chronic denervation, all findings you could potentially make by just running through the images once um, on uh, with attention to the muscles. Elbow thoughts is, uh, it seems hard because it's a, not a commonly imaged joint, but uh, if you can learn about two different uh, general pathologies, you can know a lot about what can go wrong with the elbow. And I'm just going to talk about two real quick, the valgus overload syndrome and posterior lateral rot rotatory instability. And I, and I just bring these two up because if you know these two things, it's a pretty good starting point just to, know, just to really realize that you do actually know a lot about the elbow when it comes to elbow MRI. So valgus overload syndrome is uh, from the cocking phase of, of elbow uh, throwing, especially in baseball players. And there's three typical findings that you can think of that make sense that kind of give you different pathologies on the MRIs. So you have lateral compression, medial tension, where their tension is pulling apart, and then you have posterior shear. Um, which is a kind of a rotatory fo force here den denoted in red. Uh, and it's just shown here on the right, the lateral compression will give you osteochondral lesions of the capitellum or chondrosis of the capitellum. The medial tension, the pulling apart, will give you those anterior band ulnar collateral ligament tears. And the posterior shear will give you those posterior medial osteophytes we mentioned. So just if you can just try to get those three things down, you'll like be okay, you'll be starting on those uh, track to making those findings from valgus overload syndrome. Just a quick primer there. And here's just the same, uh, the same discussion in another diagram. So here's your normal anterior band of the UCL. That gets pulled apart with this valgus overload. So you can start by having micro tears and minimal abnormality of the ligament. As you go on and get more severe abnormality, you again have micro tears, but you add the lateral compression where you can have bone contusions in the capitellum and radial head. And then finally, when you have all the findings put together, you can have different variations of tear of the anterior band of the ulnar collateral ligament. Again, you have the bone contusions and you can have those posterior medial osteophytes of the joint, valgus overload syndrome. Posterior lateral rotatory instability is the most common type of chronic elbow instability. It goes with falling onto outstretched hands, so it can be, this can be seen in the chronic setting. Um, and I don't wanna emphasize this too much just because it's so um, uh, complex, but uh, it's a contiguation of abnormality, but it all goes with anatomy that we already know because we are emphasizing how we are trying to evaluate these radial collateral ligaments, the lateral ulnar collateral ligament, and the uh, anterior band of the ulnar of the uh, ulnar collateral ligament. So you know, if you want to look at posterior lateral, call posterior lateral rotator instability, that's fine. But um, I mean, just to show you, I mean, this this says here the first hit is the luckle. So we know we, where that luckle was. We were going through it on the images. So first hit is the luckle where we have some subluxation. As we get things get worse, the luckle goes into the rest of that lateral ligament, the radial collateral ligament, and the capsular ligaments, you know, starts to tear. And then as you get worse and worse, you get a posterior band UCL tear and finally an anterior band UCL tear. So it's a continuation of injury, real uh, complex pathology that you don't really need to know. But uh, ju I, I just say this to emphasize that, you know, this is a common problem of the elbow of chronic instability. And 
you know, you really can't call it without even really knowing much about the entity because we're evaluating all these structures like the Luckel on our uh, routine uh, reading pattern approach. So you'll be able to uh, help the uh, orthopedic surgeons with this uh, entity without even necessarily saying the words post lateral rotary, rotatory instability potentially. And that's it. So at the end here, I'm just going to give you these scrollable images that you can use to uh, scroll on all this anatomy yourself. Uh, hopefully this will make you more comfortable. I hope this is helpful. Uh, please give any feedback if you want. I'm always uh, open to feedback about these. I really want uh, the residents to be more comfortable, especially towards the uh, beginning of second year when they first come in trying to read these MRIs with uh, being more comfortable with reading them. So thanks for listening and uh, good luck.